I'm about to gloss my pearly whites, knowing well in advance that I would be standing before you guys. I stopped in the mirror and stood, looking at myself. My hand found refuge on my chin, and I wondered how could I do justice in introducing the illustrious Andrew Moore. <laughs> the thoughts that followed are these. Many of you know that I have a severe infatuation with cereal. Often that gets in the way of my life. Many of you also may not know that I absolutely adore gummy bears. I, I recall those days in high school, even, even middle school, when I would sit on the floor, maybe the kitchen table, with a bag of bears, and I would scour the pits of that bag in search of that one lonesome blue gummy bear. And time and time again, I failed, because there was no blue gummy bear. To me, this was wildly puzzling. The color of water, we can say, the color of life, the color of the sky is blue, and yet there was no blue gummy bear. So for years, for years there was a void, a void within me. And I sought tirelessly, painstakingly to fill this void that, that remained uninhabited. I can happily say that my freshman year, my brother did find a blue gummy bear, and I actually brought him with me. <laughs> His name is Juniper, and they do exist. Spare me. I'd like to like him. <laughs> I'd like to like my story about gummy bears to Andrew and Moore. For years, for most of my life, I knew that there was something missing within me. I did not quite know what, and yet I knew that there was something that, that needed to be filled. When I was blessed to meet Andrew and Moore, that void to him did fill. She essentially completed me. She is the most compassionate person, most kind, caring individual I have met. She cares beyond your wildest belief. She dreams almost as much as I do, <laughs> but does surely love on the same level as I. Andrea Moore has a, a rather fond, was rather fond of, of round objects. I'm not gonna get into details, actually, sweet plums. Um, <laughs> She, she has a very enthusiastic and penetrating laugh. She particularly kind of keels over and makes some squeaking noises, but it's really good when she's excited about particular things. She is a creative goddess, as I would say, and a collaborative pioneer. She's the embodiment of gentleness, but when need be, she can act with ferocity. She is the marinara to my spaghetti, the gummy to my bear. <laughs> and I'd like to ask all of you guys for a warm, Warm welcoming of Andrew and That should be illegal. <laughs> Good Lord. Let me just turn this all on. Hi, everyone. Let me make sure that we're working. Don't cheat. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. And they're not doing it. I can see you. Okay, you can open them. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Andrea Moore, and we are standing in a landfill in the center of a slum. I see 400 hungry people, and we have 40 cups of rice. We're far from the road, too far to run if this thing goes down. And it might, I can see that. I don't need a camera to capture that fact. It doesn't take a shutter snap to trap hunger in its tracks and call it by its name. I know what hunger looks like. It looks like fear in the eyes of horses, like scores of screaming, brutish boys, like forces of evil seen and unseen Hunger is mean. For a moment, I think we could die here because we are standing in a landfill in the center of a slum. 400 hungry people and 40 cups of rice. I look Pavel in the eyes. Don't argue with me. If I tell you that we're leaving, I want you to drop everything and run. 
Pavel is a hero, a Buddha, a Brahmin. He believes in miracles, tries to touch them with his hands, so he doesn't understand. But he agrees. He can't see the forest through the trees. Inside the center of the circle, he can only see the need. Hungry people he can feed. But I, I am riding on the rim. I have a different view than him. Our guide inside is Patrick, Ugandan an orphan. He's wise as a sage and bright as a star. He's laughing and leaping, far dreaming, huge scheming. Patrick is laughing. Patrick is always laughing. He marches deep inside the slums, humming, strumming God's secret music, coming with a few bags of food and a first aid kit. And the slum kids are his holy light. He joins their fight. He spends the night sleeping under sacks and plastic, pointing out the shooting stars. The boys come running, call him uncle. They shuffle, scuffle for a better view. Patrick's only in his 20s, but I think he might be Gandhi. The fourth friend in our party is smooth and slight Sharif. He's smart and spry. Sharif's the spy, and he's here to have my back. Pavel and Patrick carry the food, and I carry just the camera. The grown-ups don't like it. I can see it. I can feel it. The grown-ups start to grumble. A man reaches for a rock. We scramble away. We find a wall. We cling. We stay. The kids we meet are posing, prancing, dancing for my lens. So I focus on these little guys until, stunned and startled, I realize that every kid has bloodshot eyes. A hollow haze, that daze induced from slugging gin. Ten-year-olds are double-fisting, listing, listless, slurring, swaying. One hand grips a bottle, the other a rag. A slug, then a sniff, makes hunger peripheral. It dulls the ache, it quells the quaking. Trash can be treasure when you're dull beyond measure. Deep in cocoon, in a swoon of not feeling, the groan in the gut goes away. And the gutsy ones say, Muzungu! Muzungu! Beat my picture, miss! By myself only! Beat my picture, miss! The boy stands in stinking filth and inflates like a balloon. I beat his picture. That's how it translates from Luganda. Beat. It's a bad verb. A mean verb. We use language like guns. These boys parade like proud hosts, but under the chest thumping, they flicker like ghosts. They pretend they're flying. They pretend they're alive, but they're just really surviving and barely and rarely eating and hardly thinking past their next meal. They're dealing, but they'll cut you if you come between them and eating, between them and drinking, between them and huffing, between them and dying. They'll cut you, they'll love you if you come between them and dine. Seeing truth can feel like spying. Patrick gathers a group like this rice is loaves and fishes, but hunger isn't holy and hunger isn't timid. Our resources are limited and I worry at the rumbling, the way the boys are tumbling over one another to get at the food. I worry at the rude way the bigger boys are edging in. The sleepy afternoon, once sluggish, now humming, unslumping. I worry that a rift can birth a riot, and I don't want to try it. Patrick sits them on the ground to calm them down. And then he stands them in a line to organize them, to civilize them, and at first they all do it. But the line of boys becomes a brawl, a surging cell, a crumbling wall, a bursting dam, a train derailed and utter fail as the bag of rice is ripped apart Torn away, the tinderbox explodes in yelling, flailing arms and legs, a felling of a forest of anger and fear, little ones crying, bigger ones vying for more, always more until the rice is gone. Vanquished. 
vanished. The lucky ones run off, banished as a have by the have-nots, and they never look back. <sighs> Thank God that's over, I think. The status quo feels safer, with no food to sway the balance. We're back to mere annoyance at our presence. So Patrick opens the first aid kit. A boy presents his leaking leg, busted by a billy club that night the cops came in and lit the place on fire. Another boy is missing toes. See, people set traps here when they take out their trash to keep out the riffraff, like starving orphaned children. Because AIDS has done a number here, a lot of numbers, really. Two and a half million children have been orphaned just in Uganda alone. But Kampala is Nairobi, is Manila, is Mumbai, Rio de Janeiro, Kuala Lumpur. Kampala is unsure about how to proceed. Does it chase the tale of progress or confront this gaping need? In the slum, I feel my whiteness like a flame. I flaunt my cleanliness like blame. I wear my tennis shoes with shame. I think making a difference here depends on being able to accept my own discomfort. But I'm wearing my own skin like a snake. I want to shake it, shed it, get it off. There's this tightrope. I am walking. I know I must do something. I can't do nothing, but what thing is the right thing? What function am I having? Standing in the garbage, carrying this camera. I fancy myself this activist purist, but am I a witness? Or am I a tourist? I asked Sharif to translate the muttering, the gutter talk, sputs, sput, sputtering from every slack-eyed source, men drunk, men coarse and angry, who pierce me with their eyes as they mutter, shuffle by, Muzongo! Mufurume! Genda ere mumerika! What are they saying, Sharif? Tell me everything you're hearing. I don't want to be protected. I'm here to be affected. But I'm terrified that my quest comes at their cost. Am I gaping at their struggle? Am I fetishizing need? This isn't a museum. These people are hungry, messy, bleeding, busy. I want to understand, but I don't want to make it worse. So first, I'll just I'll stop taking pictures. I'll shrink by this wall, my uncertainty searing. Just tell me what you're hearing, Sharif. What are they saying? Part of it's the same old song. I don't fit in. I don't belong. But there's something more that they're saying. They say that I'll take my pictures, and then I'll go back home where I come from. I'll make money off of their faces, and they'll never see me again. Are they wrong? My heart is forged to freely give, but our verb is take a picture. So much for my shining hope. My good intentions burn like rope running through my hands. A heavy thing is falling, and I cannot stop it, slow it down. I can only watch it fall. So I lean against the leaning wall. The starving boys are lean and gruff huffing on their glue, while Pavel and Patrick, our Buddhas, stick band-aids on bare flesh. Hydrogen peroxide in generous splashes stays the tide of poverty as goodwill dashes from this hand to that heart, from this man to that boy. Joy is in the contact, that simple human contact, that cotton and that swab, and the gobs of good cheer that eradicate fear. It's just one day, but it's a good day. I watch them, and I pray for all of us, for everyone, for Sharif and for Patrick, for Pavel, the slum kids, the drunk men, the drunk boys, these eight-year-old addicts. I pray for forgiveness and not from them. I pray that I can forgive myself for fumbling toward change.
Let me never so fear tripping that I refuse to walk. Let me not run from learning by doing. Let me try and fail. Offend, then mend, rather than not extend myself at all. I pray that I will not allow my fear that I've accomplished nothing. Allow me to accomplish nothing. Patrick puts a Band-Aid on the bottom of a bare foot. Look, we know this isn't working. But that doesn't mean it isn't helping. The purpose we are serving is simple. We are loving. We are touching. We are seeing. We are listening. And yes, also, we are taking. We are taking pictures, taking our time, committing to memory, and also sometimes to rhyme. These people, this place, this tender present space, we are taking it in and we are taking it out. After all the band-aids have stuck to skin and before half of them have come unstuck again, we trudge back out. We are enriched, appalled, entranced, enthralled, full to bursting, satiated from our special brand of starving. We pick our way through muck and rubbish, stuck on what we can't accomplish, sold on everything we can, knowing we don't understand, but we'd like to. There's this gritty little gateway in a grimy, ugly wall. We pause as we are walking. We are struggling. We are small. There's this sign above the doorway that divides what's out from in. Safe journey, it reads. And please, come again. We each step through. A motley crew of students, street kids, artists, orphans. We walk a little ways in silence. At last I turn and I peer at Patrick. I ask him how he sees himself. What's the title of his work? Are you a teacher? Are you a pastor? Are you a mentor? Are you a helper? Patrick laughs and flashes 10,000 tiny teeth, white and gleaming, neatly beaming. I am just a person, Patrick says to me. I am just a person. And I realize in that moment, that's all I need to be. Thank you. dip around this corner and get my water bottle. Um, hi. I'm honored to be here in the presence of so many educated, intelligent, <coughs> activated students. Um, that's not the case with all students. And so I really respectfully, I, I'm really grateful to be here and to be welcomed as a guest. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I really do hope that, uh, well, I hope that we can kind of have more of a conversation. I'm gonna try and leave some room here at the end so that you guys can ask questions and we can have more of a dialogue because even just at the top of us that we had uh, just before, I was just talking with Madeline and Alex and Colleen and I realized there's just so much, there's so much probably that we have to share. So I wanna leave some space for that. But first I'm going to tell you a little bit more about who I am and what I do and what you saw. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that before. So basically, my name, as I said, is Andrea Moore. I'm a creative activist. So what that means is that I use, for me specifically what it means, is that I use writing, photography, and performance to advance social justice ideals. So there are these things in the world that I care about, and I use art to help talk about them, to help show them. It's kind of actually much more of like the show don't tell philosophy. There are a lot of people telling and we get inundated with a lot of telling. And so for me, I use art so that I can do more showing. Oh my God, you're all taking notes. This is <laughs> highly alarming um, <laughs> and exciting. Good for you. 
<laughs> so, so there are two things that I know for certain. Now, I've had a really wacky path, and actually, I was reminded of this also at dinner because we were talking a little bit about this. I have had so many jobs, you guys. My undergraduate degree is in theater. I have a theater studies, uh, theater studies degree from Boston University. But I was kind of more like you guys. My biggest fear going to theater school, don't tell any of your friends who went to theater school this, but my biggest fear was that I'd get dumber, okay? I was really terrified about not being in an academic environment because I was a big achiever academically in high school. And unfortunately, in this culture right now, there's a lot of pressure on having to pick, right? Having to be one thing. Go, go figure out what your one passion is and go do it forever. And if you don't know it by now, you're screwed. So get out, right? <laughs> So, I went anyway, but I've had a long and weird road in terms of jobs especially. Like, I didn't come out of theater school and like hit Broadway and just like, see you later, all was good. I've worked a lot of temp jobs, I've done a, a ton of office stuff, things that like, you know, brainiacs like us are maybe slightly overqualified for, but they think you're a genius if you know how to alphabetize. It's like apparently that's a really big skill. <laughs> but I've done that, I've been a corn detasseler. If anyone's from the Midwest, you know what that is. Um, and I just keep trying, I keep adapting. But over all this time, to the point where I am now, and I, now I've been working for myself, I've been self-employed for, officially for eight years. And that means that I hustle for a living, okay? It's just in case anyone's not clear about what that means. Um, but what I'm sure of, I'm, I'm sure of two things, okay? That had been consistent through that whole way. One is I'm an artist. I'm an artist. And I finally can say that with a straight face and not be like, but my money doesn't all come from there, right? I don't care. I am an artist. It's not what I do. It is what I do. But it's not, it's not all about what I do every single day. It's who I am. I am an artist. And I've been that way ever since I was little. I mean, my first poem I wrote when I was eight in Green Crayon, super embarrassing, but really beautiful about nature. And I remember it well. <laughs> But I've always, I've always seen the world that way. It's how I process everything. It's how I process fear. It's how I process joy, boredom, confusion, everything. I always go to art, writing, performance, photography, making something with my hand. I was that weird girl in college, like everyone's getting wasted around me. Not like I wasn't doing that. But at the same time, I'm like getting the foil out of the kitchen and I'm building like a foil sculpture. And they're all like doing beer bongs, they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, can we do both? <laughs> right? Can we do both? So, I'm sure of that. I'm sure that I'm an artist. So here's the newest thing that I'm sure of, and I was not sure of this all the time. The newest thing I'm sure of is that actually to me, art is totally meaningless. Unless it helps me connect with, make, communica communicate with, and make a meaningful impact in the lives of real people. And I didn't know that. And that's not everybody's story, right? That's my story. So I'm an artist, but I also really, really, really care about people. And I actually believe that people can get along. Even people who are vastly different, who don't speak the same language, who don't have the same religion, who don't have the same preference in terms of sexuality, right? These people who aren't the same skin color. I believe that even so, these people can get along. And without, being, without participating in that, art doesn't actually matter to me. And that's new. And now that I know that, I feel better. I feel a lot better. Because uh, my star is rising. <laughs> the stars of people like me are rising. Because we never had a word for this before, but now we do. And it's called creative activism. And there are a lot of people like me, it turns out. And I just had to hang in there long enough to figure that out. But there are a lot of artists who care about things. And more and more, you know, all over the globe, people are using art to elevate social justice issues. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit first about the activism piece and, and what that means. And then I'll get back to how, how art plays a role. So I just performed this thing for you that I call Slum Story. So yeah, I went to Uganda. And surprise, so did Pavel. Guess what? He was in that. Did you notice? Um, and when I'm involved with this organization in Uganda called Uganda Project. And we're super small. We only work with 10 students. Most of them are your age. And we put them through school. So they've, most of them have been orphaned by the AIDS epidemic, or they've lost at least one parent to this epidemic. And now they're on their own, and without help, 
they would not be able to stay in school because the public education system in Uganda is working on it, but needs a lot of help. And so if you don't go to a private boarding school, you can pretty much forget about it after elementary school. So we raise money here in the States, and we send it to them. And we don't babysit them. We don't have any Americans on the ground in Uganda at all. We just send them the money, and then we're like, hey, G-Chat, how's it going? What's up? Right? Because it turns out they're super plugged in. And they're running their own lives. And there, it's, culturally, it's very accepted that people who are your age run their own lives. All right? We just help them financially, and then once a year, we go over there, and we check in, and we make sure that you know, everything's OK and that the money's being used the way it's supposed to be used, et cetera. So, Pavel and I went, uh, it was my third time to Uganda, um, and, or no, that time was my second time, because I went back in August, but we went last January, and one of our former students is this guy, Patrick, and Patrick invited us to come visit the slum with him, and there's a slum in called Kiseni, and he works, now Patrick runs an orphanage, and Pavel can tell you more about that, because he spent a month living with him there, but, um, Patrick runs this orphanage and twice a week he goes into the slum and he works with these boys. And it's like packs and gangs of kids who have no parents, who are not in school, who are living on the streets, who have no homes, they're living under big rice bags, right? And they go where they want and they do what they want. And one of the ways that they deal with hunger is by, you know, by huffing these different fumes and by drinking. Alcohol is cheaper than food. And so they're just drunk. Eight-year-old kids are just drunk, keeling over, in front of you. I didn't know that yet. So he invites me to go to the slum. So critical thinking is really important. This is something we talk about a lot in school, right? If you guys are the leaders of tomorrow, you know all about critical thinking. Critical thinking means do your homework, right? Do your homework. Do a lot of research. Think about is this smart? Um, so I did my critical thinking. I'm like, okay, we've been invited to a slum. Well, A, I'm not going to tell my mother that. Okay, that's my first critical thinking thought. Don't tell your family you're going to a slum until you safely return. <laughs> that's one. Don't tell his mom either. <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely don't do that. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, let me, let me assess the perceived gain of going in against the perceived risk of what could happen there. And I say perceived because it's very easy to act like I know what's going to happen. I know what the risk is. Oh, I know what the risk is. It might not be safe, blah, blah, blah. Stop. I don't know what the risk really is because I've never been there. And seeing Slumdog Millionaire is not actually research, <laughs> even though it feels like research sometimes, right? That's not actually research. So the perceived, but all we have are our perceptions, right? The only way to go is go. So my perceived idea of the game is, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to see something that not a lot of Americans have an opportunity to see, I'm going to learn about this, I might be able to help, I might be able to tell a story, I might be able to make a meaningful impact in just one day with these few people who show up who we're dealing with, okay, the perceived risk, I could die, weigh it out, weigh it out, <laughs> but, so then I start thinking, critical thinking says, okay, so how can I mitigate the risk? So it says, okay, we could take security, right? Because going in as white Americans, like we're gonna make an impact. You're not gonna go unnoticed there. So we could take security. And now I think about that. I'm like, okay, security presumably means some big Ugandan dudes with guns. Does that send the right message? Does that send a message that I'm here to help? That I wanna get to know you? That I hope you'll let me in and welcome me and like sit and break bread with me? Don't mind the guns, let's break bread, right? So we, we get rid of that idea. So we weigh it all out. And I also want to identify my assumptions, right? Figure out what am I assuming? I'm assuming it's going to be dangerous. Some assumptions are good, right? Assumptions are like judgments. They're judgments we, we make to keep us safe. I'm assuming it's going to be dangerous, and, um, and I'm assuming that I'm not going to be welcome, right? And it's probably in this case safe to err on that side, is that I'm not going to be welcome. Because guess why? It's not my house, right? And I didn't actually get a written invitation from somebody who lives there. I'm being brought in as a guest, and nobody else knows that. So I'm thinking about that, and then finally I have to question my motivation. And this one was harder. Because for me, there was a part of me, and I'll be really honest, that wanted just to see how bad it is. That wanted to gape. To just get close and stare at it. The same way we crane our necks when we see an accident, right? Can you believe it? 
they're standing in garbage, blah, blah, blah. The thing that will cure, that cured me of my desire to gape is the smell. Smell is something that doesn't leave us, right? Smell stays with us. Smell is something I can't predict. I can imagine from seeing a movie what it might look like. I wasn't prepared for what it smelled like. But so I think about all that, and I think about my motivations, and I was like, you know what, there's a, there is a part of me that's just like, ooh, I'm so hardcore, I'm so badass, I'm gonna get in there, and I'm just gonna be like, I am Andrea, and this is what I do, and I don't tell my mom till later, and it's cool. <laughs> and that's a big part of my personality, you guys, and it actually gets me pretty far sometimes. That audaciousness, that audacity, that has gotten me pretty far. But it could get me killed, right? If that's the only reason I'm going in, it probably shouldn't go because these are real people with their real lives, right? And they probably don't want to be gaped at. But so I do all my research. And there's this whole, this is super American. Be prepared, right? It's Boy Scouts. It's the motto of American life. It's like the Peace Corps. I don't know if you guys know this slight sidebar. The Peace Corps was actually invented during the Kennedy administration as an effort to go seed the American masculine identity all over the world. So the people that they were looking for, the way they were selling the Peace Corps in the 60s, was for young, strapping, beautiful, fair-haired, sandy men who would go out there and be like, yes, I'm Mr. Boy Scout, and I'm here, and I will build you a well, and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, this is great. We'll get everybody in the world to think that we're like, aha. And that's like what the Peace Corps came from. So we've got to keep this in mind. Like everything is sales. Like that's, that's a big part of it. But so it's this American thing about be prepared. And there's this illusion that is super prevalent in our culture that is not prevalent all over the world. But there is an illusion that if you do your homework, that's enough. You're ready. You're ready. And actually that's false. Because in the line of work that I do, you cannot be ready. You should not be ready. If you think you're ready, you better check your ego. All right? Because working on the margins, so here's my interest. My interest has always been, and look, you guys, I'm a white girl from Cherry Creek High School. Ever heard of it? OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> I know where a lot of you went to school, too. Calm down. Um, this, is, this is a lot of you, OK? Like, I'm, you know, I, we, we're grown up, we're brought up in this culture. Many white Americans are brought up in, in middle class or upper middle class white American culture. We are brought up to believe that we are entitled to go lead the world. All right, guess what? Not everybody agrees with that. And we are trained from the time we are young without even realizing it from our parents and from media and movies and all this other stuff, pop culture. We are trained to believe that if we are prepared if we do our homework, we'll be the best. And there are, frankly, a lot of situations in the world in which that is just not true. It cannot be true. And so my, my interest has always been on those, on those other areas. So I work along the margins of communities. I work, I've always been interested in like where the edge of one community is and the beginning of another one. So like I recently got to speak up in Greeley. Greeley is a great example. Any of you guys who are from there, from northern Colorado, we have this like white farmer community, and then we have this you know growing, vastly growing all the time immigrant community of Mexican Americans who do all the work, right? And these two communities butt up against each other. And then we have aid workers from all over the Western world, like developed nations, and they go into like poor, poor Africa, right? Where they help Africans see the way to be. Okay, these lines with this ragged, ragged edge. So if it's the ragged edge, it means that there's no mainstream. It's the edge. It can't be the stream. It's the edge, right? So if it's the edge, that means that there's no prescribed way of doing it yet. And if there's no prescribed way of doing it yet, then I can't be prepared, right? I can't. So what I like is going anyway. And I call going anyway critical action. So critical thought is I do my research, I be prepared, I'm a Boy Scout. Critical action is going when there is no way to actually be ready and I am going to get it wrong. Guaranteed, plan on it, absolutely can count on it. So more important than readiness in those situations is willingness, willingness. So I acknowledge, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna let go of my readiness. I cannot be ready. So I'm gonna let that go, and it's a scary feeling. A lot of Americans are really uncomfortable with that because we don't like to be embarrassed in this culture. We don't like to have our ass hanging out of a window. We don't. 
We like to be like, oh, I know everything. I've got it all handled, right? Like, and I've got 75 interns who are going to back me up, and I'll fire them if, it makes, if they make me look stupid. That's really American, right? So this is not an American way of being, critical action. It's about having the willingness to feel uncomfortable, the willingness to not know what's going to happen next, the willingness to keep moving through fear. That's the real definition of courage, by the way. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving through fear. Fear is real. Fear is appropriate. It is healthy. It is normal, and everybody should feel it. That's how we make judgments about what we do and don't want to do, right? Courage is doing it anyway. So in this case, it's so important for me to reframe my definition of success so that being wrong does not equal failure. Because I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to be wrong. I have to be willing to be wrong. And, and not think, OK, it's over. Let me go home. And now I'm done. And I better find a new line of work, right? So humility is more important than caution. And so we think like caution is super important. It's necessary. Caution is the thing that tells us, like, oh, that's on fire. Don't touch it. Right? Like, you should be cautious about that. It might burn you. But in this line of work, we don't know what fire is. We don't know what it looks like. Something that looks like fire to some people could be fine. Like, for example, one of the biggest things with racism right now in our country, you see someone, a woman in a burqa, and it's like, I don't know her. I don't know her. I don't know what that means. Right? Or it's like we see somebody in, like, the full chic outfit, and we're just like, I don't know him. I'm afraid. That's not fire. That's culture. You can touch that. All right? But then I can go over here, and it's somebody who's like, oh, super nice, super available. And I come up, and I touch that, and it's like, oh, that's actually a psycho axe murderer. That's fire. Okay? So the point is, is that I don't know. Caution won't always help me. If I'm cautious in this line of work, if I'm overly cautious in this line of work, it means I don't take action. So humility is more important. Humility is being like, OK, this might be fire. Let me touch it and find out. And let me not touch it too much, right? Let me just, let me take it easy. Let me, let me wade. Let me check it out. And if I blow it, and if I make a huge mistake, if I make a misstep, let me have the courage to try and repair it. And willingness, that humility is the thing that lets me try and repair it when I am way out on a limb, you know, and when I do make a mistake like that. So, in Uganda, going back to the actual situation, right? I'm a white American woman. I have no business in that slum. No business. And i got to be real about that. I can tell myself a whole lot of stories like, they need me! I'm sorry, there are 80,000 people living there. They don't need me. All right? If I'm going in, I better get real serious about the fact that they don't need me. And I'm going in for me. And I might have tell myself this whole big beautiful story about how one day it'll be for them. But that's why it was such a big deal when they looked at me and they're screaming in my face and they're saying, you're just going to go make money off our faces. And I'm like, shit. You know, like, I have to eat. And I tell stories. And sometimes people pay me to tell that story. And I might never see that guy again and he is never going to get that money. Can I sleep at night? Right? So I have to live with that and just be like, I want to look it in the eye. Like, that's, that's, what, that's part of the truth. It isn't the whole truth, but it is part of the truth. Right? And so there's no reason for me to be comfortable. So if I, if I think I'm going to be comfortable, then that means I need to do an ego check. Right? That I probably have this level of arrogance that's holding me back. So one of the ways that you have to get in, where we entered Kisenyi, there's a number of entrances, because this is a really big slum. Where we entered, there's this ditch of raw sewage and trash. And there was a single board, like a, like a tree. It wasn't even really like a two by four or something. It was more just like a, I don't know, like a like really worn, almost like driftwoody kind of looking just board. And like this narrow board, and there's all of these people just running, you know, walking, moving fast. In Uganda, people are like, they either move super fast or super slow. And I'm, Sure, Colleen had that experience. But it's like when they're going, they're going, and when they're not, they're chill. But so this one tiny little board, and of course, you know, we get up to it and we're like, okay, we're gonna go in. This is a this is a moment of asserting myself. Okay, this is a statement. I'm asserting myself into this community. This isn't like, oh, we just happen to be in the slum. It's like you have to get there by crossing a single board over raw sewage. You don't accidentally go there. Alright? So I'm asserting myself into this community. And so that's, it's important that I be aware of that. And so one of the ways that like the cloak, the coat I put on, 
is just a guest mentality. I'm a guest. This seems so simple, and it's like almost like, could that possibly be it? Like, shouldn't it be more complicated? Shouldn't you have to go like get a PhD in order to understand how to do aid work? Some people can. But like really, guest mentality means it's not my house. Be nice. I don't know how you guys were raised. I was raised that like when it's not my house, you say please and thank you. You ask if you should take your shoes off at the door, right? You like, you know, you are polite to the host. You figure out whose house it is and thank them. Right? You're considerate. You're polite because it's not your house. One of the biggest mistakes that Americans make in international travel is they act like it's their house. Everywhere I go, I see Americans behaving like it's their house. This is why people hate us, by the way. And I know you know that, right? But it's because we walk down the street in a foreign country wearing our parkas, like our ski parkas, which nobody else in the world does, right? our ski parkas and like our baseball caps and our loud accents and we're like screaming and pointing at things and being super loud and whatever like the Australians are loud too we'll all get over it it's gonna be fine it's part of our culture right we're boy scouts it's part of our culture but there's a difference between being loud I'm loud all right and behaving like it's your house and so one of the ways that just really helps grease the wheels is have a guest mentality say please and thank you Show, express gratitude. Don't just say thank you, show thank you. It is so simple and so many people don't think it's required. So many people don't think it's important to follow up after, to do a handwritten thank you note instead of an email, to send a gift. And in African culture, let me tell you, gifts are so embedded in that culture, right? I mean, it is a huge thing to be able to give someone a gift. And then, not only that, but to be able to receive the gift. How you receive gifts is really noticed in other parts of the world. In American culture, we're kind of like, throw it in the back of the car, I'm moving, right? But receiving a gift, receiving kindness, especially from people who maybe are living at a lower socioeconomic level than I am, right? To receive the gift, if somebody wants to give me food, of course I'm mortified. Of course I don't need their food. I will take it. Because it is not food in that moment. It is a gift. And rejecting that gift, if somebody with no food wants to give me food, it is not about, if they're giving it to me, they can spare it in their own way. Maybe not in my definition, but in their own way. It is okay to accept a gift from someone. Just because I think that they don't have as much as I do, I don't get to make that call. This is the thing about agency that's really important, I think, that a lot of times in, in American culture, we believe that, we, that agency is stuff. So if you have less stuff than me, then you don't have as much as I do. But agency is a person's capacity to act in the world, or the person's capacity to make decisions. And when I reject an offer of stuff, or of friendship, or of anything, what I'm rejecting is that person's agency. I'm saying, no, you cannot make a decision for yourself. I know better than you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that your decision is actually wrong. You have to keep that. I get it that in our culture we think we're doing the right thing. We think we're doing a favor, right? But those are just some of the ways that we have to, we have to question those embedded assumptions. So and another thing is just, here's a clue if, if you need your guest mentality. If you're outnumbered, put it on. So like here, yeah, I'm your speaker. <laughs> Do I look like it? I am your speaker, but ye are many. And I am but one. So I need my guest mentality here, right? When I teach, I teach a lot, and I'm not like a full-time classroom teacher, but I do a lot of visiting artist teaching and have taught before in more long-term situations. When I teach, that's a big thing in education. A teacher's like, this is my space, right? You guys are guests in my house. That's one school of thought. When I teach, I'm a guest in their house because I'm outnumbered. And boy, does it blow students' minds. When you look at young students especially and you tell them, you guys are in charge, I'm a guest, thank you for having me. Okay, culturally, they're trained too to think that you're the boss. So now what happens is they think you're the boss, you're saying, no, actually, you guys are the boss. And now space is created. And now there's this thing called like deference, right? I'm deferring to them, they're deferring to me. We have respect. There's respect in the space. That's a guest mentality. So this also helps resolve conflict everywhere I go. So, one of the things that comes up in this line of work, and this is just an anecdote, but I, I want to talk about this, especially at CU, because 
many of you come from Colorado. Many of you probably relate to my background. And so when, the first time I went to Uganda, I went with a, a fellow, I went with four Americans, two black Americans and two white Americans. Now race plays out differently everywhere, right? So I'm in, I'm in Uganda and I'm meeting this woman, Shannon, who's a black American for the first time. And we're talking you know, about something, and I don't even know what. And honestly, I no longer remember what the comment was, but she told me to my face that she thought it was racist. And I froze. I mean, it was just like, right? And so many things went through my head at the same time. You know, like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Like, I just like turned myself inside out with, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that, whatever, whatever the hell it was. I don't even know what it was, but like, I can't be a racist, right? Panic. And then the other thing that happened at the same time was like, fuck her, right? Excuse my language. Papa wanted me to swear, so. Um, <laughs> so, right, there was this part of me that was just like, fuck her. Because like, you know, how dare you call me a racist? You don't even know me, I just met you. You know, and like, why do you have to jump up, fly off the handle, and blah, blah, blah. This is all happening at once. But the biggest thing is I just wanted to run. I wanted to run and like hide under a bed and just be like, my worst nightmare has come true. I came from Cherry Creek High School. I've been waiting for this moment of hell my whole life. Right? Like this is what everybody thinks about us anyway. <laughs> so, but critical action says, the rule is you will be uncomfortable. Get used to it. You will be. Okay? You will be. And it says, stay put. Do not move. Let the feeling wash over you and do not move. And so because of that, because I have that way of thinking and because Shannon, thank God, does too, we had a tough time. And we had only eight days on the ground in a foreign country to figure out our shit. And so here we are trying to talk to each other, trying to build back rapport, but because we both had the willingness to be uncomfortable, we both had the willingness to not run when things got difficult, we were able to build a new thing, and it's, it's hard, but like to be able to look at her and to say, you know what, I need help understanding what just happened. I need help understanding what just happened. Because I don't want to do that again. I don't want somebody else to have that feeling again. Can you help me understand what just happened? There's a difference between being educated and having experience. We're educated to not be racist. Most of us have no experience how to do that. How to actually connect with and communicate with people who don't look like us and come from our background. It takes practice. It takes experience. And we don't have to keep our failures a secret. Because if we keep it a secret, we'll never learn. We'll never change. And especially, you know, here we are talking about global leadership initiatives. How can we go be global leaders if we're afraid to, be, to get it wrong, right? So that's one of the things, and then, the other, of course, here's the danger. The danger is um, being too hard on ourselves, right? So I have a feeling you guys are gonna relate to this. I'm super hard on myself. I hold myself to a ridiculous standard, right? And sometimes, you know, that manifests in like, I'm a straight A person, I'm like gonna get a 4.0 and like go crazy and do all the clubs and whatever. And I know many of us get that one. But, um, but also, sometimes it's just like, I'm the one that's so, this is me. I'm so gracious about other people making mistakes. I am so willing to lay down over a puddle and be like, it's okay. How can I alleviate your guilt? How can I help you get over it? You know, like, let's move forward together. But if I do it, holy hell. I'm like, what was I thinking? How could I do this? I should know better, and that's always it, I should know better. This is the danger of this line of work, is like always feeling like I should know better. But it's embedded in the thing, it's like, of course, I can't, I can't, because critical action means I won't, I won't always know what's coming, I have to not know, right? So I don't always know better. I was in Mauritania in West Africa, in the Sahara Desert, and I went with my best friend who was in the Peace Corps there. So we went back, five years after he was in the Peace Corps, we went back. Now, Mauritania, most people have never heard of it, even though it's huge. It's right below Morocco, and it's totally Sahara Desert, the whole thing. And it's also on the Atlantic coast. And it's an Islamic republic, so 100% of the population is Islamic, is, is Muslim. 
And I was there, and I have a guest mentality, so I'm in their house. So I wear a full skirt to the floor, long sleeve shirt all the way to my wrist, a head covering the entire time. And I never get to speak, like I don't assert myself, unless Matt, the man, makes it okay. And that's their house. And I loved it there. I loved it there. I can't wait to go back. I don't want to do that here. Here I like doing this instead. But I loved it there. I loved it there. One of the things that happened though, and this is where we talk about like assumptions, not when I don't do my critical thinking piece, and I don't look for my assumptions. So I'm like, oh, what would be fun to take to these kids? Like, we're gonna go visit this house where he lives. So I'm like, ooh, light sticks, that'll be fun. Like those glow bracelets. So I take all these glow bracelets. I'm like, okay, I think I'm doing my critical thinking. So I'm like, have they ever seen them before? Probably not. I'm in a village way out in the desert. They've probably never seen them before. Will it terrify them? Hopefully not. I think about that. I'm like, will they think, scary magic, run, you know? And I'm like, I think we're gonna be okay. I think it'll be fun. You know, and I'm like, let's go for it. And I'm like, okay, how many kids do I have? I have 15 kids at this moment, and I have 20 light sticks. Great. Guess what? Here comes my American assumption. There's enough for everybody. Can you see where this is about to go? I break one. And they're like, oh, wow. And I'm like, yes, it's a hit. Right. Here's one for you. Here's one for you. Here's one for you. 15 people, dog pile, punching the ever living shit out of each other. Big kids sweeping up the little ones, kicking the little ones, little ones start screaming. 15 children become 40 like that. I don't even know where they come from. 40 kids are in a huge screaming fit in front of me. The parents hear the screaming, parents come out, they're picking up kids by their backs, the sticks come out, they're hitting children with sticks, like whipping their butts with sticks. Everybody's crying. The big ones who get them vanish. And suddenly it's over except for just like the little ones who are still crying. Everywhere you can hear just crying. I am sobbing. Like in the worst horror of my life. Right? <clears throat> oh my God, I did this thing. Well, I didn't. What happened was, it's very tempting. This is actually self-absorption on a different scale. It's very tempting for me to look at that and be like, oh my god, I caused a child to be beaten. Right? Horrible, horrible person. What a horrible person am I? But that's not actually what happened. What happened was, I created an unstable situation. And the situation required parental intervention. And in that country, that's how they intervene. Okay, I didn't make them beat their children. I created a situation that they needed to intervene. And my mission on that day is not to come in and tell them how to intervene. That's a different mission. That's a mission for another day, right? And maybe that's somebody else's mission. But it's important to kind of keep things in scale and to be gentle on ourselves. And so in Mauritania on that one, I learned a big lesson. 30 minutes later, it was over. They all forgot about it. One of the little girls comes up to me and her bracelet's not working and she's like holding it to me like, it's not working, it's not working. And I look at it and she's chewed the end off and she drank it. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm like, well this couldn't have been a bigger shit show if I tried. <laughs> like, right? You know, we want to do good work. We want to do good work, but it's just like, you know, this isn't, this isn't like, I, I as one person, I as Andrea, cannot bring down the Republic of Mauritania. I can't. Even if I wanted to, I can't. Okay, so some of it, it's like, yeah, I need to like check myself. I learned a lot. I was like, wow, I sure assumed that they would share. I didn't see that one coming. I assumed I have enough, they'll share. They live in the desert, right? When I think about it now, it makes total sense. I'm like, right, it only rains like maybe once a year, twice a year. So when it rains, they clamor. You get every, when the resources come in, if you live somewhere with no resources, when the resources come in, they come in hard and fast, and you clamor to get your resources, and then you scatter. They acted exactly according to the cultural expectation. You know, I had this assumption that they would share because I brought that with me from Colorado. I see that now, and, but so this is what I mean about like, we gotta give ourselves a break. Okay, we gotta give ourselves a break because we're gonna get it wrong, we're gonna mess it up, they're gonna drink the Kool-Aid and you're gonna be like, oh my God, are you gonna die? I hope not because we're in the middle of the desert and I can't help you if whatever I just fed you is totally toxic. 
right? So, I, that's the activism piece. That's, that's like that, so for me, it's like finding something I care about and then going out there and trying to do it again and again. And one of my challenges through life, and many of you might relate to this, is that there are a lot of things I'm interested in. You can kind of tell that probably. And I've had to pare it down a little. Not pick one, but just figure out, like, if I really want to be make a meaningful impact in a, in a certain place, then, like, I should probably put more of me into it because I'm pretty powerful, actually. And I can make a meaningful impact. But I have to actually give that my attention. So for me as an activist, I have, like, my little basket of causes, the things that I really care about. And those are the things that now I give my attention. And it took me a while to figure out what they were, and you know what, they might change. I served on a board of directors for an organization, and I did that for three years, and I was really like, yeah, 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 and now I'm moving on, I'm doing something else. So it can be an evolution. But the second part is, is art, and this part's just a little bit more cut and dry. So for me, like, it's not actually a choice, right? Art, is, as I told you, it's how I process the world. So if I go to Uganda, I'm going to write about it. That's just me. And if I see something, I'm going to take a picture of it. Because I want to see it again later. I want to like go back to it and look at it later. And also, my memory sucks. And so a lot of the times, like I, that's how I remember things. I remember things in, in frames, based on like what I saw and took a picture of. So I don't have to think about the art part. The part that I have to think about is if I want to then make it public. If I want to share that art part with you, now it's going to require a little bit of framing. So that's a little bit different. And so we live in the age of information. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but this is, you guys, you can Google anything, right? Not every culture has this opportunity yet, but they will, they will. And right now in American culture, anything we want to know, we can pretty much find out. Or we can find out who's holding the key, right? So we have this, all of this information, all of this information. So I'm going to give you some, some data about Uganda. So Kiseni, this slum, has 80,000 people in it. Well, that sounds like a lot. 60% um, of people in urban Uganda live in slums. 60%, more than half of the people who live in cities in Uganda live in a slum in the city. Okay, so that sounds like a lot. Uh, I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means, right? Information does not equal understanding. Information means I know. I know. But it does not mean that I understand. Right? So if I want understanding, I need empathy. Empathy, for me, in my experience, is the route to understanding. And to, for me, the most efficient way to build empathy is through art. Because art gives us the, gives us the illusion of experience.